This program is made possible by generous supporters like you. Like I said, to be here today, and um, if you will just bear with me, it is a great honor to stand up before you this morning and um, just have a few things that I want to share with you so I won't keep you too long, I hope. Um, I want to tell you a couple of things that I have learned as a mother, and um, one of those is that children always tell the truth. See, I saw this saying one time that said, there are two things that will not lie, and that is children and yoga pants. And um, I think you women know what I'm talking about, okay? <laughs> Yoga pants do not lie, and neither do children. And um, my children, um, since they have been young, they have told me things that I, I wish I never had heard, right? Like um, recently, I'm trying to think of some of the ones. I wrote a few down. But most of the time, it's like this. Mom, are you going to go out in public looking like that? <laughs> well, yeah, I am, right? Or, or this one the other night was... Uh, Mom, you know, you're kind of looking a little old. You might need to start wearing a little more makeup when we go out in public. So, so let me tell you, I took that one to heart. And so one night I was at home, and it was late, and I couldn't sleep, and QVC came on. And QVC and I are getting tight, I'm telling you. And um, so QVC was on, and it had this makeup set. And it said, this is all you need, and you can look glamorous. You know, like five things. And, and she kept saying these words. Anyone can do this, right? I mean, anyone can do this. And I thought, I mean, I am glued in. I can do this. <laughs> she said, anyone can do this. I've got this. And so she did like, you know, 15 models and did their eyebrows and did all this stuff. And I'm thinking, I've got this. I can do this. So I got the packet home and Haley was there with me and I went into the bathroom and I mean, I did it. I had it all worked up. I had my eyebrows done. And seriously, I look like a clown, okay? And I knew I looked like a clown. But I thought, maybe I'm just being a little too hard on myself. So I went out there, and Haley was standing out there. And Haley said, Mom, you don't look anything like those women <laughs> in that book. I think you need to go back and try it again. Okay, so children tell the truth. And so do yoga pants. So don't wear your yoga pants if you don't want to know the truth. The second thing I want to tell you that I've learned as a mother is... Never say never. Never say this statement. My kids will never. Or when I'm a mother, I will never do that. Because I promise you, you will eat every one of those words. And one of the things that I said as a young mom, not as a young mom because I was an old mom, but as a new mom, we were driving, I always said, my kids will not eat all that junk food. They're not going to eat French fries, okay? They're not going to eat french fries until they're like five. Well, let me tell you something. The first time ever that I had a phone conversation that I wanted to take, this is what happened. The kid was screaming in the back. I think it was Dalton. I'm driving down the road. I'm looking for the closest McDonald's. There it is, the golden arches. I wheel in there. I get a large fry, and I do this number. Here, take it. Eat them all, right? And he's just back there pouring them in. I had said I will never, and that was one thing. And, and I hate to tell you all this, but French fries and I and the kids, we've got a great love affair because they've helped me out in some bad situations. <laughs> so today, more than anything, though, I don't really have lots of words of wisdom for you as a mom but I just want to give you some encouragement from my life. And I just want to share some things that I feel like God has spoke to me and poured into me. And I just want to give that to you today. I know that Mother's Day can have a whole host of emotions. I know that some of you are here today and Mother's Day is hard. I mean, Mother's Day is not the easiest day. Some of you are here and you've tried and tried to have a baby and it just hasn't happened. And others are, of you are here and maybe you've lost someone that you love. Maybe it's a mother. Maybe it's a child. So Mother's Day has a whole host of emotions. 
And some of you are here, and this is your first Mother's Day, and we rejoice with you, and that's exciting. I remember that first Mother's Day. So this morning, we just want to speak to women in general. Is that okay? Are you okay with that? Well, some of you who know me, you know that I am a junker, okay? I am an original dumpster diver, is what some people call me. I personally prefer the word upcycler. I think that that just sounds a lot more dignified. I'm an upcycler. I'm not a dumpster diver. I'm an upcycler. But I may or may not, like on Tuesday night when the trash is on Wednesday, I may or may not go purposely walking in my neighborhood just to kind of see what's out there, right? Because there may be a treasure that I want to take and I want to clean up and I want to spray paint and, and put in my house somewhere. I'm always looking out for treasures. My neighbor, one day across the street, I was peering out my window, and I saw a table, and I thought, I think that looks like a Duncan Five table. Any of you know what a Duncan Five table is, right? Well, no, okay. Well, it's kind of like an antique table, and it it has some value to it. So I go across the street, and sure enough, it's a Duncan Five. And I'm thinking, woohoo! I hit the jackpot, right? I mean, this is an expensive table. I know the value in this table. And being the good person that I was, I because I, I had thought, I'm just going to take it right now. I went up to the door. I said, hey, do you know that, that you have a Duncan Five table out on the side of the road? I mean, do you really want to get rid of this table? And she said, yeah, I'm so sick of that table. I have had that table for years. I'm tired of that table. I'm like, well, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, you could sell it on online yard sale. You could, you could sell this and make some money. She said, Terry, please take the table. I'm sick of the table. I want something new. And if you keep talking about how good this table is, my husband is going to make me take the new stuff back, right? So I said, sure, great. I'll take the table. So, I mean, me and my hunky man here, who this has been a source of contention in our marriage, right? I, I, I hide things in the garage that I find on these treasure days. But he took the table, and we put it in the garage, and I have it in my house, and I love that table. And I know that that table has value, right? And I like it even more because I got it for free. But let me tell you, the very first thing I want to tell you this morning is know your value. Know your value. As a woman, know your value. I think that some of you even here today, maybe you feel that way. Maybe you feel discarded. Maybe you feel like that piece of furniture that's on the side of the road that nobody wants anymore because they can't see the value in it or they don't even care if it's value and they're tired of it and they just put it on the side of the road for anyone to come and pick up. But I want to tell you something. That's not the way that Jesus feels about you or about me today. He is the original dumpster diver, okay? And here's the deal. He gets great delight out of going down into the depths of the dirtiness and digging things out because why? He knows the value that is there because he created you and he knows what is within you. So he is the original one who will go to great lengths no matter how dirty it is, no matter how bad it looks. He's going to go, and he's going to find it, and he's going to dig it out. And that's what he he does for us, for both of us today. You see, the scripture that I'm going for today and that I will repeat over and over to you is this in Jeremiah 1.5. I chose you before I formed you in your mother's womb. I set you apart. Before you were born, I set you apart. Jeremiah 1.5. He chose us. Before we were born, he chose you and he chose me. Just to give you a little testimony on that, my parents divorced when I was four and my dad lived probably 30 minutes from us the whole time that he was gone. There would be weeks, months, sometimes years that I wouldn't see him. Lots of birthdays, lots of Christmases, lots of times he would call and tell mom, hey, I'm coming to see the kids. She would get us all ready and dressed up and we would sit outside and wait and wait and wait, but he would never come. I think the hardest thing was um, 
growing up because what, what happens to you, and especially sometimes as a woman, is you begin to think this. You ready? If my own dad doesn't love me and doesn't see any value in me, then how in the world can anybody else? How in the world can anyone else ever find any good in me or ever love me? And I think the thing that kind of put the uh, nail in the coffin was this right here. As I was getting married at 21 years old, I was so excited. And listen, I wanted Bobby Allen to think, oh, she's so beautiful. Don't we all think that? Oh, I want him to think I look so good. But my first and foremost thought was this. Oh, I hope my dad thinks that, you know, I look good. And I hope he's proud. And I, I just, I hope that he, he just says, oh, Terry, you know, you, you look so pretty today. I'm so proud of you. And as a young bride, I waited in that room, and I waited in that room. And he never showed up on my wedding day to walk me down the aisle. And in that moment, there was something inside of me that really began a deep, deep issue of value, a deep issue of insecurity in my life. And I want to tell you something, that before God could do anything and take me any further, that was something that I had to dig inside this word and find out not what anyone else says about me, but what he says about me. And I want to tell you something here today. It doesn't matter what someone else has said about you. Maybe they left you discarded on the side of the road. But he, he says that you are worthy and that he chose you before you were even born. He set you apart. And that's what he says about you. He says, I knew you. I formed you. I created you. You were fearfully and wonderfully made. I botched that whole scripture up, but you get the gist of it. <laughs> he formed you in your mother's womb before he even knew you. And he chose you. He set you apart. The second thing I want to tell you this morning is, in that scripture, I chose you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. He set you apart. You were not created to be like anyone else. Isn't that refreshing? I don't have to have good looking makeup, right? <laughs> he set me apart to wear ball caps and tennis shoes every day. You have been set apart. You have your own person that God created you to be, and He set you apart. He doesn't want us to try to be like anyone else. He wants you to be you, and he wants me to be me. And he created that way. Have you ever wondered, God, why did you make me this way? Am I the only one that's wondered that? <laughs> God, why did you make me this way, right? I mean, when I was a young kid, this is what the doctor told my mom. It's like she has her, she's an automobile with her foot down on the accelerator all the way down all the time. <laughs> Can you imagine living like that on the inside? <laughs> so what he was saying was she's revved up all the time. God, why did you make me this way? I want to be like her. I used to, you know, Sister Sharp and all these so sweet, sweet women who didn't talk very loud and they were so quiet. I used to practice being like them. I want to be like them. I don't want to talk loud. I don't want to have a laugh that's like a hyena, right? <laughs> I want to be so quiet and so sweet. And you know, I had to realize that he set me apart and I'm just different. And praise God, we are all different. But if you've ever wondered, God, why did you make me this way? Romans 9, 20, 21 says, but who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have power 
over the clay? Can the potter not choose how he's going to shape the vessel? Can the potter not choose that he's going to say, well, this vessel I'm going to put flowers in, and this vessel I'm going to use for people to drink out of, and this vessel I'm going to use to uh, do my supplies in? Can he not choose? Yes. The potter has power over the clay, and he makes us and he sets us apart the way that he's designed for us to be. I like the way Hebrews puts it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Are you ready? And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Not the race God has set before you. The race God has set before me, right? It's my race. It's your race. You have your own race. And I love this. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. We have our own race. We have to run the race that is set before us, and no two people have the same race. And I love this. Who's our coach? The Holy Spirit is our coach, right? And we can't run this race without the Holy Spirit as our coach. And here's the deal. We have to run this race like this. I'm running, right? I'm running. I'm not going to run because I have heels on, and this is not contrary to what I normally wear. They're usually tennis shoes, so I don't want you to see a big catastrophe right here. So I'm going to do this. So I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, and I have to do this, right? Have my blinders on and what? Look to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of my faith, because this is what we sometimes do. We're running, we're running. Whoa. I had shoes like her. I bet I could run as fast as she does. Ooh, wow. I wish I had hair like hers, right? Because I could have those cool braids when I run and look cool. You know, oh, and look at her. She's so far ahead of me. I'll never catch her. Oh, but get this one. Oh, at least I'm in front of her. <laughs> right? Bobby and I did a bike ride one time, 30 miles. And here's Bobby and I. We're dying, okay? We're, we're not in shape. We are not qualified to do this bike ride. And this is what Bobby tells me the whole bike ride. He's looking behind him, and this is what he's saying. <laughs> Terry, just keep going. There's these two old women on the back. <laughs> he said, and they got horns on their bike, and they got to be 80 years old. We've got we've to beat them, whatever we do. We've got to beat them. <laughs> So this is what Bobby and I kept doing the whole race. Where are they? Where are they? We got to get in front of them. But you can't run your race that he has set you apart for if your eyes are constantly looking at her, saying, I wish I was like her. If I had her gifts, if I had her talent, oh God, why did you make me this way? You see, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane and run your lane with perseverance and run your lane with your eyes focused on Jesus Christ who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. Run your lane focused and determined to go forward. Because if you look back, you're going to compare yourself to something God never told you to. And you're going to fall on your face. So he sets you apart. Third point is don't let your past define you because it does not determine your destiny. It does not determine where God is taking you. See, just like we said, when we're in that race, if we keep looking behind us, we're never going to go forward. See, Christ wants you going forward. Satan wants you constantly looking backwards. And sometimes we think it's all about our past. It's not about your past. The enemy knows where your destiny is. He doesn't want you going forward. He wants you to stay back there. So don't let your past interfere with the destiny that God has before you. 
See, the rest of that scripture is, I chose you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. So he chose us. He set us apart and he appointed us. He appointed us. He appointed you. Some of you, he appointed you to be foster parents. He appointed you to write a book. He appointed you to be a minister. He appointed you to be a nurse and a teacher. See, he appointed you before you were ever born. He appointed you for good works. He has a job that only you can do and only I can do. See, Rahab the harlot, she couldn't let her destiny determine where she was headed. Pastor Mark was all over this stuff Wednesday night. I was like, oh my goodness, right? Rahab the harlot, don't you know that the women would say as they would go around, he's going to use her? Does he know about her past? Does he know she was a harlot? I mean, he's going to use her for the spies to get down? He must not know. God must not know because he surely wouldn't use her because she's not good enough. See, Rahab had to do this. Rahab had to say, oh, I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at Jesus. I'm looking at the author and the perfecter of my faith. I'm not going to listen to those lies. Mary Magdalene, seven demons. How about that? Oh, here she comes, the crazy woman. Hide. She's coming. Right? No telling what she'll do. She's crazy. Let's all hide from her. See, Jesus set her free and he put her in her right mind. And let me tell you something. Mary Magdalene couldn't keep listening to what they said about her and looking at her past. Or she would have never got to go in her future and walk with Jesus. So Mary Magdalene, the woman with seven demons, was the last at the cross and at earliest at the resurrection grave. That was Mary Magdalene. She had to keep her eyes focused on the author and the perfecter of her faith. Peter failed God. He denied Christ three times. But if he'd have kept looking back at that failure, he would have never gone forward at the day of Pentecost to see 3,000 souls come forward. If he'd have kept looking back saying, but I failed, I failed. He had to go forward. See, God is bigger than your past. And even in here today, the enemy will lie to you. Let me tell you, he will lie to you. And he will begin to whisper into your ear and say these things. If they knew who I really am, they wouldn't want anything to do with me. If they knew what I struggle with when no one's around, I have no right being in that church with those people. If they knew how bad depths and darkness of sin that I had been bound in, I can't tell a soul. I can't tell anybody, right? See, the enemy wants to keep you bound up in your past. I understand those things. I told you about growing up, never feeling value. Uh, Stories like when, you know, we lived in government housing. So when kids who you're friends with come to you and say, you know, kids, they tell way too much. Remember we talked about that? They always tell the truth. So when they come to you and they say things like this, my dad doesn't want me to be friends with you because of where you live, right? So see, if we're always stuck back there in our value. We can never go forward to what God has for us. I want to tell you, ladies, for me it was after those years when all those things in my early 20s, I battled some serious panic attacks and depression. Serious. I hid that stuff. I didn't want anyone knowing about that. Because you know why? I thought if they know, if people know, they won't accept me. They won't love me. They'll feel like, how can I ever listen to her? Look at the battle that she goes through. And you know this. Satan wants you to keep everything in the dark. And I worked in wound care for quite a few years, and I learned this one thing. When it goes in the dark long enough, bad stuff starts growing in it. 
But when you expose it out to the light, Jesus begins to take that and begins to heal it, and he will use everything for his glory. So don't let your past determine your destiny. All right. Don't run away from your destiny when things get hard. (laughs) Because things are going to get hard. Okay? I like this quote. Faith doesn't make things easy. It makes them possible. It makes it possible. It doesn't make it easy. I love what Joyce Meyer says. Sometimes you just got to do it afraid. I am living testimony of that today. (laughs) I am doing it afraid. (laughs) I chose you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Finally, I want to leave you with this. Believe God to complete what he has started in you. He is not finished with you. So believe him to complete the work. You see, in that same story with Sarah, or Sarah, and at that time, I don't know if you remember that story, but when the angel of the Lord finally came back and said to Abram, you're going to have a son this time next year, Sarah was eavesdropping. Now, I know none of you women would do that. But Sarah was listening in through the tent, and she heard it. And so she laughed to herself, and she said, How could a weary, worn-out woman like me enjoy such a pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? Then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is there anything? too hard for the Lord. So believe Him to complete what He has started. See, some of you are in a waiting season. I was in a waiting season for 12 years, unable to have a baby, and I got tired and I got weary in that waiting season. But believe and keep on keeping on because is there anything too hard for the Lord. Maybe it's you this morning, mom, and it's a prodigal son, and you're worried, and you're concerned, and you have prayed countless times, and you are just tired. You know why Sarah laughed? Because sometimes we have cried so much that there are no more tears to cry, and we almost become bitter and apathetic. Yeah, right. I'm going to have a baby. Yeah, I've heard that before, right? But the angel of the Lord said, is there anything, is there anything too hard for the Lord? What I promised you, I will deliver to you. What I started in you, I will finish. But keep your eyes focused on me. Don't get sidetracked. Don't be looking around, but just keep your eyes on me, the author and the perfecter of your faith.